All right, I've got another couple, Emily and Amy, for the visibility series on the Birth Story podcast. This series is a three-part series. We had Katie and Jess. Now we've got Emily and Amy. And then after Emily and Amy, we've got Amy and Steph. So I hope you will enjoy learning about what it's like to go through a fertility journey as a same-sex assigned at birth couple. Okay, so this week, it's Emily and Amy. They have such a unique love story that I wanted to ask them lots of questions about their love story and then their very interesting, unique, and I think super cool fertility journey. So we talk about all the things, including transvaginal insemination with a self-selected donor. So this is part one, and then part two, we'll get into the birth story next week. Okay, enjoy. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does a day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. Before we get started, I would love to have you guys in Birth Story Academy. It is premier childbirth education for your hospital birth no matter what the birth looks like that you're planning. So medicated, unmedicated, a wait and see attitude, a belly birth, an induction, there is a module for all of it. And I have a blank name tag at your seat waiting to put your name on it. And the best part about Birth Story Academy is that I get to be your virtual doula. You go into my private Facebook group where I interact with you every single week and cheer you on as you plan and prepare for the birth that you want, no matter what that looks like. So I hope you will go to birthstory.com and enroll in Birth Story Academy today. Amy and Emily, welcome to the Birth Story Podcast. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. We're doing well. I'm so excited that you guys are here to do this visibility series with me where we are talking to couples who have the same sex assigned at birth journey into parenthood. And so in your case, do you identify lesbian, queer? What's the best term? I think both. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we are um, both cisgendered. Um, we consider ourselves in a lesbian relationship. I think we both identify as queer. Um, we identify as a queer family. And I'm so excited to hear your birth stories. <laughs> so we have Audrey and Noah. Yes. And my kids got to play with your kids this summer in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was really yes. fun. Okay, how old is Audrey and how old is Noah now? Audrey is six. She turned six in July and Noah is coming up on four. He'll be four in February. Doesn't it go by so fast? Yeah, it does. It really, it's just crazy. I mean, I remember seeing a picture, Amy, of you pregnant doing Mm -hmm. some sort of like wild yoga pose, you know? (laughs) And because I also have a six-year-old, we were pregnant at the same time. And I had gained 70 pounds and like could barely move. And then Amy's like on a side of a mountain doing like an inverted (laughs) yoga yoga pose. (laughs) And now here we are, we're six-year-olds. So um, let's start at the very beginning. So like how in the world did you guys meet? What's your love story? Hmm. Ha! <laughs> I'll let Emily start that one. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, 
We met at work. <laughs> uh, Scandalous. Tisk, yes. tisk. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, so it, it's, it is an interesting um, story. Uh, and at first, when we first met, um, Amy was in um, a long-term relationship with uh, a partner. Um, I was also in a long-term relationship um, with a, she was in a lesbian relationship. I was in a, a heterosexual relationship. Um, we met and worked together as colleagues. And I was in the position at the time of uh, actually being her supervisor. <laughs> um, Ooh. Yes. Yes. Did, um, who got fired? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I think as we, my take is, you know, I, I felt very connected to her initially for whatever reason. I, you know, I believe that in energy that connects people. And, um, and, you know, I think that was a awkward space for us to try to be in, um, given the relationships that we were in, not only interpersonal relationships, but the work relationship. Um, <clears throat> Then what ended up happening uh, was that my husband passed away suddenly, um, and um, and we were s- suddenly in this uh, strange place where I was no longer uh, partnered in a relationship, um, and um, Amy had a shoulder to cry on. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, and and things kind of uh, evolved quickly from there. Um, where we were, you know, spending a lot of time together. And I think considering ourselves, you know, um, trying to figure out where where we were with each other in relationship, um, Amy ended up breaking up with, with her partner. Um, and, um, and we spent, uh, several years, um, trying to figure that out. And I think, I think because of the trauma in which we came together initially, we had a lot of work to do to sort out like, you know, a healthy space to be in together. Um, we, we broke up, we got back together. We broke up again. We got back together again. We broke up. Um, the last time we broke up, uh, <laughs> Amy was essentially like, this is it. Um, we are. Cause when she says we broke up, she means <laughs> she broke up with me. I waited around. <laughs> she broke up with me. I waited around. And so finally on the last one, when I finally, I threw in the towel, I threw back everything. I said, I am done. This is a relief. I am going to move on with my life. Um, then I, yeah. And I think that gave her space to, really engage with a therapist and, you know, just get into her trauma and start to grieve. I mean, this was five or six years later. Um, And so she kind of fully went into her grieving process and healing from childhood stuff. And then I was, you know, doing my thing. Um, (laughs) And and then, yeah, suddenly when we came back together, I was much stronger and independent. And she, you know, because I wasn't just waiting around and she was much healthier and able to give me back what I needed. And, you know, to make Uh a short story long, where you know, like we met 17 years ago and here we are. Yeah. (laughs) My work partner, Colin, always says, long story long. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Whenever she gets into anything. So you guys have known each other for 17 years, but yeah. this like back and forth, like dating thing went on for five or six years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That feels exhausting. Just listening. To yeah. It, to it like, might've even been longer. Yeah. I'm like, oh. We were married in 2013. And so yeah. that means we were, yeah, we didn't finally settle into a solid groove until 2012. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. so Emily, for yes. everyone listening to this podcast, I, you know, and I could go do a whole podcast on like your husband dying. Cause yes. my, my inquisitive <laughs> brain is just like the therapy in me is like, I need to talk about that, but that's not what right. the birth story podcast mm-hmm. is about. But, mm-hmm. um, so you were married to a man is, yes. was it just like, you know, Amy super hot and you were like this is my friend or prior to that had you been attracted to both men and women yes um yeah I think I I had always identified as um bisexual I guess you know what or maybe pan although pan was not a term at the time um you know so yes I I had identified as bi um but 
partnered with a male a man, a cisgender man at the time. And, um, and had been with him for 10 years. Okay. So it, it got to a point where I was avoiding her. Like she was this <laughs> beautiful, feminine, like I avoided her because she was this scary, you know, I'm this kind of little twerpy thing. And, you know, like, so I was, yeah. And yeah. she was your boss. So and there was that. And, she, and I was this little <laughs> screw up, you know, I was coming from the military where I was like, this was life or death. And like, what in, what in our job could be life or death? Why am I following all of these rules? And she had to try to keep me on track and, yeah. and just some, you know, I don't know how my screwing up was attractive, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it evolved and it evolved definitely. It sounds like slowly over time and kind of grew mm-hmm. like what a good foundation though, that it grew from like, Oh, a work relationship and then to a friendship and then into a relationship. I would love for you guys to define, or Emily, since you said it, for you to define for my audience pansexual. Well, so the way that I I understand it is that um, pansexual folks are, um, are, are attracted to people um, uh, of all kinds. Um, and they could be cisgendered, they could be transgendered, um, uh, identifying as male or female. Um, and it's more about just the individual that you're attracted to. And, um, and yes, so. I like it. That is exactly what that is. <laughs> like, um, plus. Yeah. I, I have always considered myself a- attracted to individuals. Um, so, you know, I, I, growing up in high school and everything I had, I had attraction to many different types of people. Um, and, um, yes, and was in varying stages of different relationships with different types of people. So I think that that's probably the most evolved human being on the planet is someone who's (laughs) attracted to a person for the person (laughs) rather than like their body parts or what they look like, you know? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think the other thing about, um, about identifying as as pan is or pansexual which i i don't know i mean i struggle with that because also, <laughs> it's a white men right gen- there, gen- yeah <laughs> well gener- generationally too i feel like you know i'm like i don't know if as a gen x or i get to say that i'm pansexual like <laughs> but um just but, millennials yeah <laughs> so. yes um but i think i think to me it's also like i'm super attracted to non-binary folk um you know and i would say like on the spectrum of things like like Amy's definitely, you know, she identifies as cisgender, but, you know, for like, she reads as, you know, <laughs> non, non-binary um, and I'm super attracted to, to that, you know, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, I went to Glennon Doyle and Amy Wambach's like uh, Mm -hmm. event last night. It was like a live event for the Untamed book launch Yeah, uh, for the Untamed journal book launch. And I'm like sitting, I'm like, I am, trust me, I'm really heterosexual because my life would be super easy if I was just like a little bit gay, like a little (laughs) bit, like a little bit on the spectrum. Like, you know, my marriage and my life would be simple. Right. But I'm looking at Abby Wambach and I'm like, you are so hot. I'm like, you are making me consider. So (laughs) (laughs) anyway, well, moving along from that, I was like, like, I really like to hear everybody. I just love love. So I like to hear everybody's love story. (laughs) One thing about coming back together was that uh, Amy had made it very clear in phase three um, that she was interested in not just being together, but really moving into this phase of family and kids and, and marriage. And at the time I was definitely not ready for that. And so a lot of my work, um, in that breakup phase was, you know, thinking through those things. Um, and so when we came back together, the final you know, the, the final time, the for real time, it, you know, I, I expressed to her that, you know, I am, I am now I've done my work. I'm ready for marriage. I'm ready for kids. You know, let's do this. Um, and I said, prove it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she did. Oh, I did. She did say prove it. Yeah. That is that is awesome. I think I probably would have said that too. So right. well, that was going to be my next phase of questions is in your relationship how old are you guys like what's the age age the same age difference 
for, I'm four and a half years older. Okay. Four and a half years older. And so, um, and Audrey is six. So about the time that you started thinking, not when you got pregnant, but thinking about having a family, what ages were you? 38 and 34. Okay. 38 and 34. And, um, When you go into phase three or phase five or whatever you want and you've (laughs) decided that like a family is on the table, do you have a conversation? Like, how does that look like? Do you have a conversation right away when you are a a queer couple like that says, like, if we're going to do this, it's going to look like this? Like, did we know you wanted to be bio parents? Like, did you want to adopt? Did one person for sure want to carry? Did you both want to carry? I mean, I want to know how that conversation went down. I think it was a series of conversations where we just, you know, we talked about all of the different models that we knew about um, and and possible options that we knew about, you know, anywhere from adoption to, um, you know, to uh, sperm donation to getting a known or directed donor um, and, you know, trying with one of us or or first or the other first and who wanted to carry who was interested in carrying so we I think we talked about all of it and I think we were lucky in that we had um we didn't have a lot of space to try to close gaps to try to close in terms of what each of us wanted um uh, you know I think my my guess is that other couples you know have stronger feelings one way or the other about how they want to see it um, happen. Um, but we, we, we weren't, we didn't face that. I don't think, I mean, I think we, we pretty quickly got to that. We wanted a known or directed donor, um, first as a first try that we, and I think we originally was, I I was interested in caring and that's why we started with me. No, I think, so I think we were both, I think it came as a shock that I was really connected to carrying. I would really, I think I do want to carry because I want that connection. And I, I, I think I want that experience. Um, and I mean, mm-hmm. I think that was, that played a part in it, but then when our timing was ready, I had just started mm, PA right. school. Mm-hmm. So I was going through a whole career change. I had two years of really, really intensive school to do. She was finishing up a master's program. And so the timing really became that she could start trying. And I think, so we went that, or that, that was our plan then. So we decided we would start with her. Okay. Um, I don't think I felt, I didn't think my age was a problem. I felt like I was very healthy. I've always been very healthy. I've never had any medical conditions. I I couldn't imagine any reason why this might not work, but that's my obvious, like I'm always fairly obliviously, you know, optimistic. (laughs) (laughs) Shucks. Um, So I think we started with her, but then we, it was, we had to find a donor, right? Mm -hmm. At first we thought that would be hard, Um, but then it's, you know, men really want to procreate. <laughs> that's, that's all we learned. <laughs> so you guys arrive at this decision that Emily's going to carry. Did you do any um, fertility testing? Like, did you do ultrasounds, anything like that to like look at not, follicles, blood work? Not at that point. Not no? at that point. We thought we're just going to get the syringe and the cup and we're going to find somebody to put something in it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, we, we didn't have any reason to believe that we, you know, that, that, that we would have any fertility issues at the time. So I think, um, just from a cost savings and a speed, we're, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're very frugal. Um, <laughs> I'm very frugal. I will, I will own it. Um, I would, we're like, let's just get into it, you know? And then, um, and we and, weren't, we weren't in a rush, yeah. you know, so we were only like 39 years old and 35. <laughs> we were not in a rush. What's the hurry? You know, <laughs> I will say, I was, you know, I was, I don't remember how old I was, 36, 37, I think when I got pregnant the first time, something like that. I don't know. But I just recently went back to the gynecologist and said something about getting on, you know, birth control or getting my tubes tied or something like that. And she just, the midwife sort of laughed at me and was like, (laughs) Heidi, you're 43. Like if you were trying really hard to get pregnant, you have a less than 1% chance of getting pregnant. And I was like, really? When did that switch? 
You know, I was like, I was like, I mean, I just, just had a baby like six years ago. And she's like, yeah, it changes a lot from then (laughs) until 43, you know, but right. I mean, at 34, 38, 39, I mean, Mm -hmm. most people are not concerned at this point Mm -hmm. about their, Mm -hmm. about their fertility. So from what I understand from some of the previous interviews that I've done and all of the couples I've worked with as their doula over 17 years is that it really comes down to self-matching or going to the cryo bank. Right. Mm -hmm. So is, so is these is and and Emily's frugal. So she was like, Nope, maybe we could Mm -hmm. self-match. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And, and I really, I, I think I liked the idea of the possibility of, of no, you know, kind of knowing in more detail, like who this person was, not that you don't through the cryobank. I mean, you, you have a, you know, kind of a, a bio of the, who the person is, but I like the idea of actually physically knowing that person. Um, and so I think that's why, and, and we, you know, we explored like family members of, you know, in so, our brains. We yes, actually, like, right? No, we didn't. We did not have the conversations. But you know, I, I think that's also a common route is for the, you know, the a sibling of the non-caring person to to donate. Um, we didn't end up going down that route, but yeah, I think those 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 were those were the more appealing aspects of directed donor was that we would know this person. Um, Yeah. And so for my listeners that are in heteronormative relationships that, you know, have penetrative sex with ejaculation and no fertility journey. And right now are like, I don't know anything about fertility. So we're talking about IUI, which is intrauterine insemination as like a step one, right? Like, no, not even, not even vaginal, intravaginal, intravaginal. Oh, yeah, wow. We're just literally, we're turkey basting, but it's the only thing available. If you mm-hmm. don't have yeah. in, you do just need to figure it out. And this was part of our frustration was almost like, we're not giving money to the man who is behind this racket where everybody has to do this. And there are no shortcuts just mm-hmm. because you want to have a baby conceived mm-hmm. by not having <laughs> penetrative sex with a penis. Okay. Uh, so I think some, depending on the situation, um, some people do go straight to IUI. Um, I think there's a lot of things that, that would, you know, lead someone to do that. I mean, I, I think there, there's, um, uh, you know, you can process the sperm and make sure, you know, there's no diseases and all of this stuff. Um, but, you know, we, we went through enough with our, you know, the, the people who we selected to try with that we were comfortable doing this intravaginal route at first. And we did explore IUI in terms of like, could we do this at home? You know, I was in PA school, so I was practically a professional. Exactly. <laughs> you could totally do it. So, yeah. We did explore it, but the sperm has to be cleaned. And so you still have to pay a bazillion dollars to go through the whole sperm cleaning mm-hmm. process and all of that. Um, so yeah, we just thought, why not just do it from a cup, you mm-hmm. know, the old fashioned way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Kind of like that movie. I'm trying to remember the name of it. where like the friend, like in the bathroom at the house. Remember? And it's like, up on the wall. and it's like seven years later yeah. and he's like, this kid is mine. You know, yeah. um, I'm trying to remember what the name of that movie is. Dang it. <laughs> It was really funny. Um, Okay, so you self-selected a donor. And then is there like legal, like do you have to have like a a word document that says like, hey, we agree to not be, uh, give up parental rights or something? Yeah, that's kind of what we did. So we went through the first person, or when we had just started exploring this, we, I was at the grocery store and a former next door neighbor of mine was behind me in line and I, she said she was clearly pregnant with her third baby. And I said, wow, wow. I said, you know, we're, we're actually, we're getting ready to think about having kids too. And I said, you were, you know, we're just looking for sperm now. And she just looked at me and said, oh, my, my husband has such great sperm. And she was offering. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. It's amazing. We considered him for a little bit and then we met with them once and they were moving and there, was, there was other stuff, a few red flags. And we were like, eh, let's move on. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then we, I was doing a yoga teacher training class and I had met this darling gay boy. Um, and so we thought, you know, why don't we ask him? The babies might not be the tallest, but come on, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we asked him and he and his partner were fine with that. Um, and so we drew up 
basically we had, a, we knew somebody who she actually happens to be a lawyer and she had kids with a known donor. So she gave us her paperwork that she had used. Mm-hmm. I, you know, changed the names of the interested party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and so we submitted that to him and he signed it. And then I had a friend look over it. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and then that is who Emily tried with. And I never tried with him because we did a few months of trying to make that happen. It was the loveliest. I mean, we would go to his apartment. That sounds dirty. <laughs> it doesn't. But this, I'm like, I need to know all the things, you guys. I'm like, if I have all these questions in my head, so does everyone listening. I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm like, how does this go down? Oh, we would go to his apartment yeah. and he would, he'd have handmade homemade chocolates that he would be feeding Emily after. Yeah. I don't think that's the detail. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So I, I would say, you know, there were a lot of lessons learned in those first few times, um, you know, where we eventually got to when we started with Amy and our, and the person who ended up being our actual donor was, um, you know, tr- doing, uh, really rigorous fertility tracking um you know so but we weren't there yet when we just started with me because we were brand new and we didn't know anything so i think we were doing our best guess around ovulation um time and so we were you know setting dates to meet up with him when we thought i was ovulating so we'd show up he would go into the bathroom do his thing into a cup uh, or his bedroom, we, yeah, his bedroom. wherever he would, yeah, separate room. I was waiting, you know, legs up in the air. Um, we would, um, uh, was his partner there sometimes? sometimes I was like, give him, give him some help, man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and, um, and then, you know, we would tuck it up into a syringe and then, yeah, yeah. intravaginal, yeah, yep, yeah. inject, and, inject, and then so, orgasm, yeah, stimulate because, an orgasm to stimulate an orgasm because that helps the jelly. Right. That, it's, it, it, we kept reading it. it. Yeah. It makes the cervix dip down. Mm-hmm. And so we'll scoop it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, wait an hour or whatever. All those kind of, you know, I don't know if those are evidence based approaches, but that's what we did. They are actually, you know, yeah. like the, the legs in the air. I think the more important thing is not standing up and having dark yeah. gravity and then like the sperm comes right, right out. Yeah. But like yeah. this is so important for all couples that are having fertility of any kind, right? The orgasm and then the lubricating jelly. So just being turned on, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really important even for someone who's just going to do IVF, right? And this transfer Mm -hmm. and IUI, I mean, like to, to have your body in a, in a heightened state of arousal really helps. And that there is data behind that, but really Mm -hmm. helps with getting pregnant implantation, Uh carrying sperm, all of these kinds of things. Yep. Lowering the cervix, dilating the cervix. It's a tiny little bit, you know, for more sperm to get through. I mean, all the things I've learned this through, through a lot of things. Um, Uh Even my own fertility journey, which was very short, 10 months long, but like I will have couples that are like, Oh, we had sex. Like, heterosexual couples that we had sex. I'm like, Oh, like we yeah. need sex needs to be for pleasure. Also, like that's, what's mm-hmm. really going to help it. So I'm gl- so glad that you mentioned that. And then like, I, for sure, like, you know, I for sure had my legs up in the air for like 30 yeah. minutes. I was like, if I am not standing up and losing this stuff. You know, yeah. it's not coming yeah. out, you know? And I think at this point we ha- weren't as on top of like, so with the next door that we went to when I started trying we weren't on top of the whole, like, and I have counseled so many patients on this now too, that like, he needs to have about three days. He needs to clean his system and then wait three days and have three days of ejaculate in there before you go for it. And then don't have sex two days in a row, wait a day for him to accumulate more again. And like Mm -hmm. this whole thing. And so here you are telling this person who volunteered to help you make babies that you can't have sex for three days or you you can give, Mm -hmm. Um, but (laughs) that you you need to like this kind of rigorous schedule of when you cannot and can ejaculate with your partner. Mm -hmm. Um, And our first one was not as, um, he was willing to follow the instructions. He was just a little bit 
I guess ADD. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was hard. It was like, oh, and like we'd say, you know, it's tonight is the night that it should be perfect. And he'd be like, well, like, could we do it Thursday? Like, I'm totally free on Thursday. And we're like, that's not how this works. Or like, whoops, just had a sex. And so I'm a yes. little dry right yes. now. So all of those details on how much they need saved up and all of that kind of, we learned that through this process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These are yeah. all things to think about. So if I, like, mm-hmm. if there is, I hopefully there are some couple that are listening and they're getting ready to start on this journey, like learn from Amy and Emily, right? Like Mm -hmm. be proactive versus reactive, right? So Mm -hmm. like if I was your doula, your fertility doula, I would have been like, we need to temp, we need ovulation sticks, like, you know, Mm -hmm. a little bit more sciencey behind it. Like we need orgasms, we need feet in there, we need all that thing. Okay. Couple things before we jump to Amy's fertility, right? Mm -hmm. Is, Mm -hmm. um, how long does sperm live, stay alive? Like how quickly do you have to do that transfer? And then, um, yeah, I think that's the first yeah. question I want to go yeah. through. So we, we had read that ideally there's after a certain amount of time, um, you know, it, it starts to liquefy and that's actually good for insertion. Um, and so we were under the impression that we should be trying to get this done within an hour. Um, we had friends going through the same thing at the same time and, you know, they were like getting it and then driving across town with a brown bag, trying to get it back to their partner. And they were quite successful and it it was probably an hour. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, I think 60 minutes was where our, I I don't know the data on that, but yeah, we were, we were looking at 60 minutes keeping it warm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ours was immediate. Okay. The reason I'm really asking this too, there's a second, there's an underlying question. There's a setup setup is that, um, you know, there was many times when I didn't want to get pregnant. Let's say for the Mm -hmm. 37 years before I was married. Okay. (laughs) And the pullout method OK, no. the right, reason yeah. that I need to bring this up is that people yeah. need to know that yeah. sperm stays alive and it likes to swim. And if oh, it's yeah. anywhere near anywhere mm-hmm. near your vagina, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it can go north. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OK, so anyway, yeah. so yeah. so at least an hour. And then yeah. we do know that it can stay um well, at least I know that sperm can live like up like inside for six days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a really, yeah. a really long time. Okay. So we're mm-hmm. going to, we'll fast forward because I know how this ends with Amy carrying both babies, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Emily, I wanted to kind of, I want to understand, like, was there resolution? Did you, was this male factor infertility? We don't know. Did you, did you have a fertility issue? Like what made, yeah. what made you switch to Amy being the carrier? Yeah. So we did, we we didn't try, you know, again, like all the lessons learned, we didn't in fact try that many times, um, as many times as I think a lot of, you know, heteros do, you know, my understanding is that for like a uh, healthy, fertile couple, heterosexual couple, you know, it could take up to nine months or a year, right? We didn't try that long. Um, I did eventually get some testing, which uh, I think didn't reveal anything. We had the same profile on yeah. testing. Okay. Yeah. So, so we do believe it, it was male infertility factors. Um, and, and so I think that, yeah, we had, that was the lovely thing about that particular person is, you know, very healthy communicator. We ended up, you know, just, mm-hmm. T- talking with him and saying, you know, we, th- we need to move on. Um, and, you know, we're so appreciative, um, of, of the time and the commitment and the energy. And he's such a lovely person that he totally understood. We're and, still in touch with him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think, and actually I wonder one thing to look into, um, again, I don't know any of the data behind this, but one of the things that we thought might be impacting the fertility was that he was a hot yoga instructor. And so he was consistently getting his core body temperature really mm-hmm. elevated for hours, right? Cause he's in there teaching. Yeah. And so, yeah. And uh, I don't, you know, I, <laughs> I've never had sex with a man, so I don't know about ejaculate. <laughs> and so I had never seen anything to compare it to, but I kind of down the road, I realized like this was probably not going to get anyone pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, we tried to talk with him about like, Oh, maybe, you know, you, you take off a couple of days of teaching, you know, beforehand, or you, you know, wear different clothing or whatever. But I, I think it was, you know, probably not enough to, to make a difference. And, um, and 
and also a really big ask for him to change his you know, I mean, that's his profession. He, and was, he was pounding like really healthy juices and smoothies and water. Like that, that was one thing he did for us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not smoking, you know. Yes. Smoking. Yeah. But yeah, maybe yeah. not holding out for three days. Who knows? Right. It's possible. Yes, it's possible. Yeah. So how yeah. long did this go on for, Emily? Three, four? Yeah, maybe four. Four, four cycles? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. We, we love four cycles. Yeah. Or maybe six at the most. It wasn't more than six, I don't think. Yes. So I will tell you, I mean, I I, I was 10 cycles before I got pregnant on on progesterone and on hormones. Like, you know, I don't know how it affected you, but every time you think there's a possibility you're going to have a baby, Mm -hmm. it's very disappointing for both partners. Yeah. You know, like... We both were like, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's so hard. Four months. It seems like you just said short period and like heterosexual couples sometimes go for a year or more, you mm-hmm. know, but like. That was four months of like, oh, I think your breasts are tender and oh, I'm having yeah. some symptoms and I'm having some signs. Yeah. And then, yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it definitely is. It's an emotional roller coaster for sure. Um, that is very difficult. And yeah, I, I think that, and yeah, yeah. We, we would like see signs that we wanted to see and all of the things that I think everyone does when, when they're on this. And yeah, yeah. So. it sounds like you did the fertility testing, both of you. So at some point, did mm-hmm. you to just take a break altogether from it? Like, or did you just go right ahead and, and say, Hey, Amy, why don't you try? Well, we got to the point that I was then like 10 months from graduation. Okay. And so we thought, you know, I could try or 11 Mm -hmm. months maybe. And so one month, so I think we had finally moved on to, I was doing rotations, um, medical rotations. Um, So I was done with my classroom sessions and we came back together for one classroom session. And through all of this journey, I had a classmate who kept offering <laughs> to father our children. Sure. Unquote, right. And I just was like, I never took him seriously. I don't even think I mentioned it to Emily. I mean, it was just so like, just come on. Like, he, like, okay, frat boy. Like, I don't know what's <laughs> going on here. Like, this is weird. He's 10 years younger, um, which still puts him at, you know, an appropriate age. <laughs> um, and so we had come back, Emily and I had finally talked about it and we're like, okay, we're kind of over two. Let's get another, I think maybe like I can find out if he's serious. And so one day in class, he was sitting right in front of me with the one week on campus, probably the last time I was going to see him again until graduation. And I sent him a, an email. He was sitting in front of me and I sent him an email and I said, on a scale of zero to 10, zero being so joking and 10 being, I want to, I want to give you sperm for the rest of my life and father a thousand children. Like, where are you? And he, first he gave me a, uh, you know, like the stiff necked look over your shoulder and I just <laughs> about died. Yes. And he emailed me back 11 so, oh wow! Oh that totally. made like that made me just feel so good inside. <laughs> it was shocking. I got, I got yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my and gosh! He, yeah, and it's you know he had these things about him. He's just he's you know he seems like this real bro, you know. And mm-hmm. but then I'm like, wait, but he's like donated bone marrow, and I've seen a picture of the woman whose life he saved, and he's a paramedic and a firefighter, and now he's in PA school. Like the guy wants to help people. Like he's a good human. Yeah. And so we met up with he and his girlfriend at the time, and she was she's not his current partner, um, but. She was kind of the over the top. This is probably not super interesting, but <laughs> tell it she was she was all over, the goss over the top supportive, <laughs> but like in that way of like, I've never met lesbians before. And so now it's like, oh my gosh, how can I not support this? This is the greatest thing a person can do. And, and can we be besties? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was very over the top, um, but it turned out and we said yes. And then scheduling started to happen. So she tried with the one we had been trying with. And then I had tried with the other because our timing was about two weeks off. And we were like, well, twins, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be funny? Yes. <laughs> and so, yeah, that month we had an offer. Mm-hmm. Neither of us got pregnant. And then 
the second try with the third <laughs> mm -hmm. third donor with me, we ended up in, in, a, in <laughs> we had to drive an hour to meet each other at some at a mutual friend's house because we were both doing our PA school rotations and we met down in Olympia in somebody's like side house <laughs> that we call mother in law apartment <laughs> that we call the Love Shack. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God, that make, can you, I want to sing that song now. Maybe that'll be the theme song. <laughs> Love Shack is a, I'm, okay, sorry. Yes. I can't um, handle it. <laughs> and so, and that's where it actually, he went into the room and left his in a cup. I went in there. Um, at this point, I still was dry heaving and gagging every time I had to do the procedure, <laughs> pulling it back up into the syringe and all that. You're super gay, Amy, then for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. You're yeah. just as gay as I am hetero then. Well, wait till you hear you the know? first story where she took me to Lowe's to like, <laughs> yeah. while I was laboring. Talk about super gay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. But yeah, and so the second try with him ended up working. So was yeah. Emily, Emily, were you there for the no. second no. one? No. No. Okay. So no. you're on your own now for the orgasm, the transfer, yes. yeah. all of it. That is being, but it was, it was just a timing issue with her rotations yeah. and, and our donors, you know, and they had to meet, like, like she an said, an hour and a yeah. half away from here. So okay. for whatever reason, I wasn't able to go. And yeah. And our first try ended, I mean, our first try with him was also, it took much longer than we expected. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we had started out very romantic and then <laughs> the taxi came and went for him. <laughs> And then we kept waiting and waiting. And this was our first try with him and, you know, half an hour of romance and then like half an hour of watching a TV show. <laughs> and then by the time it finally happened, we were, you know, we, it was like less than romantic. <laughs> uh, the pressure. I can't even imagine the pressure, yeah. though, I, you know, I think so. I, I mean, it was at our house, so not his environment. And, you know, and he went to the bathroom and we were like, oh, no, he could have gone to the bedroom. And now we're in this awkward place where he has like a laptop in the bathroom, but we could give him more space. But we can't knock on the door anymore. Like this is just awkward. Right. And yeah. did you have another bathroom or were, did you like have to wait if you had to pee? No, we did. You we did. did. Okay. Yes. So. Yeah. We have a whole backyard too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good point. Good point. Yeah. I was like, this would be really funny. We were like, excuse me, I need to pee really quick. You're going to have to start over. Yeah. You know? I'm a lesbian needs a toilet to pee. Come on. <laughs> uh, so on the second try, Amy. Yes. You mm -hmm. get pregnant. I, I, we get pregnant. Uh, we think we're, we, I don't know we're pregnant. Emily goes uh, two weeks later, three weeks later, I was like, I've never been so tired in my life. You know, we climb mountains together. We climb Rainier. Like we do, we do massive things together and we had gone for a hike and I had very tired legs. And then uh, we thought nothing of it because you block out this whole idea that you're trying to get pregnant and maybe it's that you're pregnant and then the next day, I think she had, she was going for a hike with a friend of ours and I, she left and, you know, at some point during that, and I had decided not to go, which is the first time I've ever said no to doing something like that. I'm like, I need to lay on this couch and I need to do nothing but lay on this couch. And so I lay there and about an, hour, about an hour <laughs> after she left, I thought, oh my God, I might, oh. <gasps> So I got up, I put my running shoes on and I sprinted. It's a mile and a half to the Walgreens. And I sprinted down to that corner. At one point I tripped and did a whole somersault in front of a restaurant and everybody's staring at me and I'm like limping along saying, I'm okay. And I, I get to Walgreens, I get the pregnancy test. I sprint back home and it comes back and it's positive. And so, and Emily- And you're that. alone again? <laughs> we have a very functional relationship. It's a very rational, <laughs> get the job done. Mm -hmm. uh, she also never carries her cell phone. So I had to send a picture of the positive pregnancy test to our friend who then showed it to her at the summit of that mountain, which I think was equally yeah. wonderful. Oh, that's, I feel like yeah. that's very romantic. It, it was. Kind of was. And she's our best friend, you know, one of our best friends. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, so yeah. We, we got to the top and, and my friend was like, oh, I've got a message from Amy. And yeah, she's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, shows me the picture. And yeah, it was really, really And are funny. you just like jumping up and down? Like, I'm going to oh, be yeah. a mom, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah, uh -huh. I would be like, Emily, yeah. don't fall off the side of the mountain, yes, exactly. you know? No, I think there were other people out there and it's kind of an exposed 
the, you know, summit. And yeah, I was, I was jumping around. We were screaming, we were telling people and yeah. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. This is so exciting. All right. Yeah. I know that was like a long, like ramp up to get to the birth story, but like, it's so important. It's so yeah. important to like dig yeah. into these details because I want people to be educated on like, all the things that you can mm-hmm. do, right? Like, sure, you can do IVF, sp- spend mm-hmm. $60,000. Sure, you can do IUI, right? Yeah. You can also go to the cryobank. But, like, I love hearing the story about self-matching, mm-hmm. saving money, Emily, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a little bit of medicalized thing in there at some point mm-hmm. where you guys did the fertility testing and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, for the second one, yeah. Yeah. Before our second yeah. one was born. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the journey, the process for Noah was, was much different than the first time around. Okay. Um, so yeah. Why don't we give the highlight of Noah mm-hmm. and then I want, let's do a birth story. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I think this is important because you asked, I think you were going to ask a little bit about how the, how the laws impact this. So, um, with with Noah, I think we tried intravaginally a couple of times, and I think we you know we realized uh, we need to, we do need to speed this up a little bit, and we can't try for a year intravaginally with 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 Noah um, because Amy was you know then older, and I think getting to the point where the the decline is happening more quickly in terms of fertility, right? So that's 43 by this yeah. point. This yeah. age where the midwife told me I can't get pregnant, so I don't need to worry about yeah. the tubal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's how old you were. Okay. Yeah. So. so we did, we went to, um, you know, we went to a, a, a company here that does reproductive medicine um, and, uh, and, you know, started exploring um, IUI or IVF um, with a directed donor. And I think, um, I think what was challenging for us was, uh, the idea that if you are in a lesbian relationship and you want to use a directed donor through the, um, fertility clinic that they have, they require a quarantine period for the sperm, uh, with STD testing every month and yeah something else um but the counseling yes oh and counseling and all so so they don't they they put all of these pieces into place that that you're required to do and they don't allow you to well we eventually got it waved away but it took some work to to say you know we we already have one one child with this person like (laughs) you know all these things that all these hoops you're making us jump through are ridiculous you know we we were literally in the love shack for kid number one and now you're like you know going to the other extreme um and it's costing money and it's costing us time and it's and it's you know homophobic and all of these things and So we were finally able to convince them and, and kind of, I think, go the route that, uh, that a heterosexual couple would, would be able to go if they were doing directed donation through a clinic. That part was really frustrating. So I, I do think, you know, it's worth people understanding what those requirements are in their state before they go down the path. Um, so just so that they can plan accordingly. Yeah. I just had a memory that <laughs> With the second donor, Emily, they went to a clinic for something. <laughs> and Emily, we, to save money, we were going to have him pretend to be her husband. And he was like, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. And he couldn't do it. He was so awkward because he's so gay. <laughs> He was like, no, I can't even pretend to be he straight started, for like started, one second. Started, I think it all fell apart. But the fact that we had to even think to have him pretend to be her husband or boyfriend or partner just to like yeah. get on the path that everybody else just is automatically plugged into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. And I mean, I think I'm going to mention this on every episode, right? Like depending on the state that you're in, what mm-hmm. is homophobic about insurance companies number one, and state laws is like they require infertility, most insurance companies for up to one year before paying, paying Mm -hmm. for anything. So if you are pansexual, if you're queer, if you're a lesbian, whatever, Mm -hmm. when you are 19 years old and you go to the doctor, you need to be like, I've been trying to get pregnant and I just can't seem to get pregnant, you know, and you need to keep saying that you can't and they don't, you know. 
Mm-hmm. Make that <laughs> history with your insurance of infertility. Right. They don't need to yeah. know that you're having sex with women and mm-hmm. that's why you can't get pregnant. You and just... so much of this, right, we've been trying for years, right? Right. Um, <laughs> so much of this is so a women's issue. Like, I think, you know, that with uh, women and, right, we've got all these abortion laws coming up and, like, these women's rights are so important because, you know, they're going to, they're going to make us jump through all these hoops to try to get pregnant. And uterine then, rights. Uterine rights, yes. right? Yes, yeah, sorry, not women's rights, uterine, uterine rights. Um, and then at the same time, like you have to jump through all those hoops if you decide you don't want to get pregnant. So you have, been, they're trying to talk you out of tying your tubes or doing anything else. Yeah. And I had a patient recently who came in, he's 24 year old male, born with a penis, male identifying. Um, and he came in and I said, well, you're coming down from urology. And he said, yeah, I just had a, I just, I just got my tube snipped. Mm -hmm. Uh, He did just had a vasectomy. And I said, you're 24 years old. How did they let that happen? He said, well, I just said, I, I never want children. I never going to want children. And so they did it. And a woman has to go through like a year of counseling to, to have this option offered to her. You have to prove above everything that you don't want children. So there's these they, yeah, I could go on for an hour, but they block the path for <laughs> they bl- the p- the path gets blocked so much so that in my state in North Carolina, my hetero couples, my hetero doula clients that ha- say the dad or the male partner is azospermatic and like has <laughs> slow swimmers or misshapen, whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? Male factor infertility. And mm-hmm. they go to the bank and get a sperm donor. No problem. Never questioned right. on, yep. never questioned as to whether or not that's the parent, birth certificate problems, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Same story, queer couple. Mm-hmm. Go, infertility, go get sperm, come back. The non caring parent has to adopt their own child. And the Department of Social Services has to come and interview you on how fit you are to be a parent. Then you have to go to the courthouse and state your argument on how you're saving for college. It's <laughs> so insulting. It's so fucking yeah. insulting. It's so homophobic. I it's it's all the things. So right. anyway, did you so you didn't have to do besides this this IUI IVF reproductive thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, were you just both considered right of way mm-hmm. parents? Right. No yes. full legal rights. Yes. yes. All the yes. things. Okay. Yes. Luckily, I think Washington state's laws are pr- very progressive in that sense that um, to Washington. Yes, we, we got the birth certificate yeah. issued. Um, I will say my one issue was that I think on the actual forms, it's still at, at the time that Audrey was born, it said father, father, by the time Noah was born, it said parent one and parent two. So oh, that's excellent. Yeah. So, excellent. So okay. He's officially the father now on the birth yes. certificate. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I'm the father for, for Noah and parent <laughs> two. We ended up, you know, going reproductive medicine for Noah um, and IVF. Um, instead of we, I think, I don't even remember. I think they didn't even recommend IUI. They said, just go straight to IVF. Um, and so we did egg retrieval. Um, and, um, who did egg retrieval? Yeah, I did. So our, our profiles were equal. Okay. And my first pregnancy was like, I mean, I, I, like you said, I was doing handstands at 39 weeks pregnant, you know, it was such an easy pregnancy. Um, and I think if all, if our profiles are equal and I've already done it once, then, you know, I, we know that we know that something's going on in there that's going to work. Mm-hmm. So we chose for me to do the second one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we did the egg retrieval for me and then we ended up with, you know, it started out with 13 and then it went down to six. And then by the time we actually had embryos of, available, it was one. Mm-hmm. So we had one viable embryo. Wow. One, yeah, one chance. Okay. Yep. So and- Amy, had you tried again or did you just go straight to IVF based on your now age? I think we tried either once or twice. It wasn't okay. more than twice. And I was like, you know what, even if I do get pregnant and you know, the chances of losing the baby are high, right? My eggs, my egg quality is down. And I had talked to a, a guy in a, a OB at this point, and she said there is a drastic decline after 40 to 41 to 42. Like it's, it's just, you know, pretty steep. Yeah. yeah. And, and I thought, well, what if, you know, if I have, if I do get pregnant and we have to wait 12 weeks to find out that something is just horribly wrong, 
now that's another 12 weeks. And then that would be another, you know, six months of, you know, going through IVF stuff. And so we just said, you know, it, it's fine to pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and by the insurance the... had better IVF coverage. Okay. <laughs> that's I was going to say. Yes. I was going to say, you were able to prove your, your infertility at this point, probably just yeah. based on your age, honestly, Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you right. know, mm-hmm. like yeah. at that point. Yeah. And so for, for everyone listening, what Amy is saying, like when it goes down to that's based on all the testing, right. And yeah. then growing like day one, day three, day five. So yes. did so you I had 13, I had 13 eggs retrieved, six were inseminated successfully. Okay. And then it got down to two that had replicated cellularly and then, i think survived oh, the freezing there were um three three sur- three had survived and we actually sent those off for genetic testing okay you know, one of them did not have some significant chromosomal abnormalities isn't that so eye-opening i i um, think the the process of of um getting from you know many many eggs to one viable embryo was very eye-opening and i think reinforced our decision around you know kind of going pretty quickly to ivf at this phase given our age and everything else (laughs) and you know i think they were honest with us that like implantation isn't a guarantee either right so you've got and at, at that point we had also made the decision that if this didn't take that we would not go IVF again. Um, I think, you know, just all of it was a lot, Mm -hmm. a lot of expense, a lot of impact on, on her with the hormones hormones, and the injections and the so we would have we would have been exploring other options like adoption at that point. And um but yeah we they they um implanted uh, um the the one viable embryo and and that was little Noah. Well, Noah, and, and the day the day that they did implantation and that they told us was the day that we had to do it. Guess what? We had a family oh. vacation. Yes, I came back early, <laughs> so I wasn't there again. <laughs> Which might have actually been, I mean, like you know, if you're super superstitious and like. <laughs> So I stayed, I stayed at the vacation with my parents and Audrey, Amy went, came back to Seattle, met up with a friend who went to the procedure with her and I was not there. Um, I was, that's what works, Emily. So you know what? Uh Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've covered IVF a lot on the podcast. So I just want listeners to know that for time's sake, we're going to kind of skip over Mm -hmm. the process of IVF. Yeah. One thing I do want to add about IVF that we had a problem with and other people I know have had a problem with um, is making sure that if you're doing IVF, there's a bazillion medications that you need and shots and all of this. And it seems like they never all get to you. And so the night that I had to do my trigger shot, that was the one thing that wasn't in my package after I'd been doing everything else. And we had to call and somebody drove, you know, an hour and a half to meet us at the clinic. And we had to pay out of pocket for this $500 shot that should have been included. And, and I've, I've heard this multiple times, just make sure that the list is exactly what you have when you're mm-hmm. going home with your medications. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's you really, that's really good advice because the last thing you need, like the day before is right. adrenaline and cortisol mm-hmm. right. and lack of yeah. sleep and all the things like mm-hmm. we're still mammals. And in order to get yeah. pregnant, we have to be private, safe, undisturbed, yep. you know, mm-hmm. and not have it being pumped full of like adrenaline and cortisol. Right. Yeah. So yeah. really good, really good points. Okay. So two really different fertility stories, like mm-hmm. wildly different. I'm like, this is amazing. All right. Let's talk about birth though. Thank you for being part of the birth story family and listening to this episode on Tuesdays. Every week our doula diaries, little snippets and tidbits from my week, along with some teaching and education And then on Thursdays, we meet here for our birth stories and our expert speakers. So thank you for being here and listening to the podcast twice a week. And if you are left wanting more, like Heidi, I've listened to all the episodes, I've read your entire book, then I hope you will meet me in Birth Story Academy and let me be your online childbirth educator to prepare you for your hospital birth, no matter what that looks like. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. 
My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare 